Well, you folks quieted down very quickly for me. Welcome to the McElhaney Ballroom of the University of Scranton for the 2012 T. Linus Hoban Memorial Forum Lecture Series. My name is Rob Farrell. I serve the university as its general counsel. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone here tonight as someone with a foot in both camps. Uh, both as a 20-year member of the Lackawanna Bar Association and the University of Scranton. Now you're assembled here this evening to enjoy the latest installment of a lecture series dating back 35 years. This lecture series and the funding to support it stem from the generosity of Genevieve Kelly O'Brien Hoban, aka Booty Hoban, in memory of her husband, Lackawanna County Court of Common Pleas Judge T. Linus Hoban. Judge Hoban is a proud son of the University of Scranton. He attended when it was St. Thomas College and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from the university in 1958. We are proud to claim him among the Scranton family. The forum in Judge Hoban's name is designed to bring speakers to the community with expertise in the areas of law, government, and public affairs. The 2012 installment of the Hoban Forum is the latest in a distinguished series. We've had many notable speakers, among them William Rehnquist, Yitzhak Rabin, Alexander Haig, Sheila Cast, and most recently Christiane Amanpour and her husband James Rubin. Now you'll hear more about our speaker in a moment, but tonight we're delighted to add to that list Peter Bergen. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Bergen for his time this afternoon meeting with our political science and our military science students in smaller sessions. And I'm sure that was a very powerful educational experience for them. Thank you. Now dating back to the 1980s, the university has enjoyed a partnership with the Lackawanna Bar Association to bring the Hoban Forum to the community and to sustain it for future generations. So it's in that spirit of partnership that it gives me great pleasure to introduce the president of the Lackawanna Bar Association and an alumna of the University of Scranton, Jane Carlonis. Thank you, Rob. On behalf of the Lackawanna Bar Association, we are pleased to co-sponsor the Hoban Forum with the University of Scranton, and we're especially pleased to welcome Peter Bergen here with us tonight to join our distinguished list of speakers. Judge Hoban earned his law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. His distinguished military career with the U.S. Army and Pennsylvania National Guard spanned service in three wars before his retirement with the rank of Major General. Judge Hoban was elected to the Lackawanna County Court of Common Pleas in 1935, and he remained on the bench for 33 years, serving for many of those as President Judge of the 45th Judicial District. I'd like to thank all of the members of the committee who are listed in your program, as well as representatives of both the Lackawanna Bar Association and the University of Scranton, who have worked tirelessly to coordinate all of the details for the program today and this evening. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce attorney Frank J. McDonnell, who is a member of the Lackawanna Bar Association, a former member and chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Scranton, and also co-chair of the 2012 T. Linus Hoban Memorial Forum Committee, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and uh, I am privileged to be one of the few, I think, who remembers Judge Hoban. I uh, practiced before Judge Hoban at the beginning of my legal career, and uh, my father practiced before him for 40 years before that, and they were good friends, and uh, so I knew Judge and Mrs. Hoban very well, and they were very outstanding members of our community in every way, in the law, in 
every community affair that went on. So this is a great tribute to him that his wife mentioned in her will when she passed on that the university keep this tradition of honoring T. Linus Hoban, who was an outstanding citizen of, of Pennsylvania and of our county of Lackawanna. So it's my privilege tonight to introduce our guest speaker. And since the inception of this in 1978, the Hoban Forum has hosted, as you heard Rob say, some very prominent people, the Chief Justice of the United States, the Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, the Prime Minister of, of Israel, the Prime Minister of England, the Chancellor of West Germany. And so it's been a long list of great people who have come here and honored our university by their presence. So tonight we have another great uh, American and a great citizen of the world to be with us. Mr. Bergen, Peter, received his master's degree from Oxford University and has been a lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. A leading authority on foreign policy, national security, and the new generation of terrorism, Peter Bergen was the last American to interview Bin Laden in 1997. That encounter served as the basis for his book, which is his book, 206, which was called Osama Bin Laden, I Know, and the CEN document, documentary in the footsteps of Bin Laden, which he produced, uh, produced that year. In addition to his position at CNN, Peter has serves as the director of the National Security Studies Program at the New American Foundation in Washington, D.C. He also serves as research fellow at New York University Center on Law and Security. And he is a member of the Bipartisan Policy Center's National Security Preparedness Group. He's an award-winning author. Peter has written two bestseller books that have been on the New York Times list now for some time, the first being The Longest War, The, Lo the Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda, and most recently, the bestseller Manhunt all of which, and all of his input with the intelligence community of our country led to the demise of bin Laden on May 1st, 2011. Mr. Bergen has traveled repeatedly to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia to report on bin Laden and all of Al Qaeda. He has many speaking engagements around the country, and most recently, was invited by our government to tour in Pakistan, the site where bin Laden met his death. Last night, he spoke in New York City to the Global Partnership for Afghanistan. And on November 14th of this year, he will deliver the address for the Daniel Pearl Memorial, Memorial Lecture at Stanford University in California. And somewhere in between all of this, He's going to find time to celebrate the first birthday of his son on November 17th as a one-year-old son of Peter. So it is, gives me great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest this evening, Peter Bergen. Thank you very much. Uh, Frank, for that uh, generous introduction, and thank you to the Lackawanna Bar Association and the University of Scranton for inviting me to come to speak to you this evening on the occasion of the Linus Hoban Memorial Lecture. And um, the title of my uh, address is Manhunt, the 10-Year Search for Bin Laden from 9-11 to Abdabad, which also coincidentally is the title of my new book, which is for sale outside. Uh, and. Um, you know, I, I started writing this book um, really the morning after bin Laden died, but um, I've been preparing, in a sense, for it for a long time because I'd spent, uh, as, as Frank mentioned in his introduction, I'd met bin Laden in 1997 um, and interviewed him then. And the way that I got into this story was I had lived in New York in the late 80s and early 90s, and you may recall that the Trade Center was attacked for the first time in late February of 1993. And um, you know the, the plan was to bring the towers down. And um, 
Instead, they killed, they managed to kill six people. Now, the people involved in that attack had one thing in common. They'd all, many of them had fought in Afghanistan against the Soviets or been involved in the effort to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. So I went with a team from CNN to Afghanistan in the Civil War at, during 1993, and we did an hour documentary. In fact, it was a 90-minute documentary basically saying that we thought Afghanistan would be the source of additional terrorism in the future, and there seemed to be a group of uh, jihadist terrorists from around the world that were assembling there and th that they were likely to do other things. And unfortunately, that prediction turned out to be all too true. In 1996, bin Laden's name surfaced for the first time publicly. And one of the things about the attack on the Trade Center in 1993 is these people seemed organized, and organizations have leaders. And when bin Laden's name came up in 96, I said to my bosses at CNN, perhaps he is the leader of this organization. We don't know what it's called, but this seems to be an organized group. And then um, in 1997, I was able to go to London and meet with people associated with bin Laden who were living pretty openly in London at that time. Most of those people are, um, have, have been in prison since. Um, and basically began a negotiation to meet with bin Laden, which was quite difficult. And that's one of the reasons that it was difficult to find him after 9-11 is that he these were a very disciplined, secretive, paranoid group of people before, long before 9-11. And um, suffice to say, getting to see bin Laden you know, was difficult and complicated um, and uh, was a lot, quite a lengthy process involving traveling to Pakistan with two, two of bin Laden's friends um, and then traveling over the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan, which was then controlled by the Taliban, and uh, to a city called Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan. And uh, they were kind of scoping us out, out along the way. Uh, I think they were making sure we weren't being followed. Bin Laden's associates were sort of scoping out what we were doing. And uh, one night after waiting around in Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan for several, after several days, another one of Bin Laden's media advisors came and sort of looked at our equipment and said, look, you can't bring any of this equipment with you, um, which is, you know, we had professional level, you know, $50,000 camera. Um, but clearly, this was, this was not something that was open for debate. And um, they said, we will supply a camera, we'll supply a generator, we'll supply everything. Do not bring anything with you except the clothes you are wearing. Don't bring a watch, even. Because they were concerned that, that we would be secreting somewhere some electronic tracking device. And uh, the following night, a, a, a van came to our hotel. It, w it had curtains, and the three heavily harmed men were inside the van. Uh, they got it, told us to get in. We drove from, from Jalalabad towards Kabul, which is uh, in a westward direction. Um, and then at a certain point, we turned off. And by now, it was nighttime. And uh, we were given some kind of crew blindfold. And we were transferred into another vehicle, four-wheel drive. And we drove up a, basically, it wasn't a road. It was like an improved uh, riverbed. Um, and um, into the mountains. And we came to a mud hut in the middle of the night. I calculated, um, I mean, we probably got there around 9 or 10. A couple of hours later, bin Laden appeared out of the darkness. And everybody in the room knows considerably more about bin Laden, of course, than we did then. I wasn't really sure what he looked like. He was six foot four, very thin. Um, I thought he might be a table-thumping revolutionary. He presented himself sort of as a cleric. If you didn't know what he was saying, it was like he was reading the phone book. He was very monotone. Uh, but he was, in fact, declaring war against the United States. We asked him, "Who does that? A, is that a war against the U.S. military? Is that a war against U.S. civilians? He said, it's really a war against the U.S. military. If American civilians get in the way, that's sort of their problem. And so, obviously, over time, they became even more radical. After the interview was over, I thought I, I, it was all very interesting. I mean, these people were seen very well trained. We had been, we'd gone through three wings of security. Everybody had RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, or Russian submachine guns. and. You know, everybody treated bin Laden with a lot of respect in this group of people. And, but at the back of my mind, it was like, this guy's declared war on the United States. We're in the middle of, of, of the night in Afghanistan in a mud hut in a country which is essentially in the Middle Ages. How do you actually execute uh, that declaration of war? And a little over a year later, on August 7th, 1988, 1998, um, Al Qaeda blew up two American embassies uh, within nine minutes of each other. It's hard to blow up one American embassy. To blow up two almost simultaneously is, is, is more than doubly hard. It showed a level of coordination. It showed that bin Laden was serious. It showed he had no compunction about killing uh, civilians. Um, 
you know, the, the, where the bombs went off were Kenya and Tanzania. These are obviously African countries, but with very substantial Muslim populations. So about 12, Ameri 12 Americans died in these attacks, and more than 200 Africans, many of them Muslims. So not only did it demonstrate that bin Laden had no compunction about killing civilians, it also showed that Al-Qaeda had no compunction about killing Muslim civilians, which is one of the many weaknesses they have, uh, and which would become clearer and clearer over time. So fast forward to 9-11 and the hunt for bin Laden. Um, when I sat down on May 2nd, 2011 to start writing this book, I thought to myself, what are, the what are the big themes I need to kind of encompass in this book? And it seemed to me there were maybe five things I needed to kind of deal with. One was President Obama as a decision maker, because after all, he made the decision. Two was um, kind of the Agatha Christie story of the hunt for bin Laden, which was really a CIA hunt, by the way, conducted by, to, to a large degree, by women. A big cultural shift at the CIA over the last 20, 30 years has been the uh, you know, much more prominent role that women play at the agency. Also, the ep evolution of US Special Forces, which were very different kind of, you know, they were pretty good before 9-11. They've become, um, you know, incredibly skilled in the, in the post-9-11 era. Another theme seemed to me to be um, the question of US-Pakistan relations, which were getting worse and worse as this decision was made. Um, another theme that I think was unavoidable to consider was to what, to what extent did coercive interrogation, I don't use the word torture, and I don't use the word enhanced interrogations. Enhanced interrogations is a euphemism uh, that is used by the intelligence community to refer to coercive interrogations, and I think torture means it's kind of a vague term um, because it means different things to different people. But I use the term coercive interrogation, and this, clearly this had a role in the book uh, in, in finding bin Laden. And also I had to think a little bit about what bin Laden was doing after 9-11. After all, um, he, you know, and, and what was Al-Qaeda doing? How, how well were they doing in the post-9-11 era? So let me start with what was bin Laden doing. So as you, I'm sure many of you know, Bin Laden staged what hit one of history's great disappearing acts from the Battle of Tara Bora in December, mid-December 2001. Um, bin Laden was there. Um, there weren't enough American boots on the ground. There were probably about 70 American soldiers there. There were probably 100 journalists at the Battle of Tara Bora, a fact that I think sort of speaks for itself. The international journalism com community could get to Tara Bora, but the US military, for a variety of reasons, didn't put any more boots on the ground, despite the fact that they received requests from the uh, the overall CIA commander in, in, in Afghanistan, a guy called Hank Crumpton, requested a battalion of rangers, which would have been 800 uh, guys to go in. Uh, there were troops available. Uh, I'm not saying it would have been easy. I'm not saying even if you put 800 rangers in, it would have been, you would have got bin Laden. But the fact is, we knew that bin Laden was there. There were multiple radio transmissions intercepting his voice in the mid-December time period of 2001. After that, he disappeared. So what was bin Laden doing? Well, the first thing he did, which was incredibly smart, is that instead of going into Pakistan, which is where everybody thought he was going to go, he doubled back into Afghanistan. He went into a very remote mountainous area called Kunar uh, and spent uh, probably several months there. Then he goes into Pakistan, and for the next nine years, he lives in Pakistan. Uh, during that period in Pakistan, he has four kids. Um, most fugitives don't have multiple children when they're on the run. In fact, most fugitives don't bring their three wives and a dozen kids and grandkids with them, which is what bin Laden did. Um, so he was, you know, he's sort of a family man. He's been living, he got married for the first time when he was 17 to his first wife. He's had six wives, one of whom divorced him and one of the marriage was not con consummated. Um, and when he got to Abdabad in Pakistan in 2005, which is where he, of course, he was found, he basically created the life he'd had in many other places in Sudan and Afghanistan, which is he had separate living quarters for each of his wives and um, he, they lived, all his wives, the first wife uh, was the 62-year-old Saudi with a PhD. These are well-educated. Second wife, a 54-year-old, also with a PhD from Saudi Arabia. And the third wife, uh, the youngest wife with whom he was basically living uh, at the time that he died, she was 29. She married, he married her when she was 17. He was 43. He presented him, she, when bin Laden married his youngest wife, he, she was presented to his other wives as somebody who was well-educated and 30. It turned out she was, hadn't completed high school and she was 17. But despite the fact that the, the wives weren't very happy about this new addition to the family, um, by the time they were living in Abdabad, everybody was living pretty uh, well together. 
bin Laden, they were growing their own crops. They, I was the only outside observer to get inside to look at the compound where bin Laden lived and died. Um, and it was interesting to be there because you could see that each of the wives had her own little kitchen and her own little bathroom. Bin Laden's bedroom, uh, had it, had, he had his own little bathroom about the size of this lectern, uh, kitchen maybe twice the size of this lectern. Um, he was not living a, you know, they were, money was tight. Uh, you know, Bin Laden was not, uh, didn't have millions of dollars at his disposal. He was paying the two bodyguards who were protecting him a couple hundreds, a hundred dollars a month each. They were growing their own crops. They had bees to make honey. They had chickens uh, for eggs. They, they had cows for milk. Uh, they were slaughtering a couple of goats a week. Uh, very, I looked at the electricity and gas bills. They were paying very, very, very small amounts of money. 24 people lived on this compound because it was Bin Laden, his three wives, a dozen kids and grandkids the two bodyguards who were protecting him and their families and wives. Um, so they're spending maybe $50 a month on gas and electricity in a, in a part of the world where um, it gets pretty cold in the winter. Uh, there was no air conditioning. Um, and the beds that people were sleeping on were basically pieces of wood just hammered together. So it was not, you could say on one, one side, it was not a luxurious life. Yet on the other side, you know, here is the world's most wanted man living for more than five years in a pretty large Pakistani city in the middle of the country with his three wives and kids. And um, although he, he was living in a prison, a prison of his own making, uh, nonetheless, it was not an uncomfortable life. And he was reading books, and he was, people were printing stuff off, off the internet. He was writing very long memos to members of al-Qaeda about what to do, uh, which, of course, would be transported by courier because bin Laden was not using a, a cell phone or any kind of phone. He was not using the internet. So that was what bin Laden was doing in the last five and a half years of his life. His organization was under a lot of pressure. We now have 17 documents that have been released by West Point from, that were recovered in the, in, the, in the compound. And what's really interesting about those documents is they provide Al Qaeda's own assessment of, it, of how it was doing. And they, it matches pretty well with, I think, the assessment of the people who were looking at Al Qaeda, which is Al Qaeda was under a lot of pressure. Bin Laden was writing about the fact that the American drone program in Western Pakistan was decimating his organization. He was telling his guys, you know, maybe you need to move out of Western Pakistan into Afghanistan, which would be safer. Um, he was advising his 20-year-old son, Hamza, uh, to escape to Qatar, which is one of the richest countries in the world, basically the Switzerland of the Middle East. He was very keenly aware that the brand name Al-Qaeda was very, had lost a lot of its luster. Um, to an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Somalia. He said, don't use the word Al-Qaeda in your name. Bad for fundraising. It'll attract neg negative attention. They were very aware of the fact that Al-Qaeda in Iraq had damaged the brand considerably because of its uh, uh, campaign against Muslim civilians in Iraq. They were hard up for money. They were talking about kidnapping diplomats to, to make money. Um, and the, the portrait that emerges from the documents that bin Laden was writing himself is of an organization that was under a lot of pressure. So how was he found? Um, for many, many years at the CIA, the, the trail went cold. They would have what they called Elvis sightings, where you know somebody saw, said that they saw bin Laden in Rio de Janeiro. Even though that was very unlikely to be true, it had to be chased down. And there were many leads that didn't pan out. Um, and at a certain point at the agency, it became clear by 2005 that there was going to be no magic bullet about finding bin Laden. There was going to be no detainee who said, you know, tomorrow he'll be at X place in Karachi. The detainees didn't really know. I mean, they might have a general sense of where he might be. And so a female analyst who I call Renee in the book at the CIA wrote a memo in 2005 saying, and it was entitled Pillars. She said, on these four pillars, we will find bin Laden. And the pillars were, Bin Laden's communications with his family, Bin Laden's communication with other leaders in Al Qaeda, Bin Laden's communications with the media, and his courier network in general. Now, as it turned out, the first three didn't really pan out because his family members were either with him and therefore had no need to communicate with him directly, or they were not in touch with him. His communications with other leaders in Al Qaeda never, we, the United States never really intercepted one that could lead back to Bin Laden. Similarly, his communications with the media, including Al Jazeera. We, the United States was never able to intercept one of these messages in a way that led back to bin Laden. So it became an analysis of the courier network. Bin Laden wasn't communicating by cell phone 
or internet, but he was somehow communicating because messages were getting through to the media. And who was the courier? And this is what takes us to the question of coercive interrogation. To be, was it useful or was it not useful? And this is the Agatha Christie story. So bear with me because it's, it's not, it, there was no single thread here. So in 2002, the guy who was really going to be the 20th hijacker, a guy called Mohammed al Qatani, he had arrived at Orlando Airport in August of 2001. Waiting for him outside was Mohammed Atta, the leader of the 9-11 of the plot. A INA, uh, an, an immigration officer thought that this guy, Mohammed al Qatani, a Saudi who didn't really speak English and was on a one-way ticket inside the United States, there was something wrong about his story, and basically told him, you cannot come into the country, and, and fingerprinted him. Um, and this guy got very hostile and said, I'm going to be back, and, and, and then was sent back to Saudi Arabia. He goes to Afghanistan. He's at the Battle of Tora Bora. He goes to Pakistan. He's arrested by the Pakistanis. He's handed over to the United States, and he's sent to Guantanamo. In Guantanamo, he said that the reason that he was in Afghanistan was because of his strong interest in falconry, which, of course, wasn't true. Um, and uh, after about a year, they matched this guy's fingerprints to the guy that they that had been sent back for, uh, from Orlando Airport. And they concluded that this person must be an important person in Al-Qaeda. He was then subjected to a regime which a uh, Susan Crawford, a federal judge who'd been appointed by Reagan and was then appointed by the George W. Bush administration to oversee Guantanamo. She said that what he, the, what he had, the kinds of techniques that had been used on him amounted to torture and he could not, never be prosecuted for anything as a result. What happened to him? He was kept up for about 45 days. Um, he was subjected to extremes of heat and cold. Uh, when he dozed off, he was blasted with particularly annoying tracks by Christina Aguilera. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he was forced to perform dog tricks. Um, he was you know, abused comprehensively. Somewhere in there, he said that a guy called Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti was the person who had instructed him before he arrived in the United States on how to communicate secretly and was an important person in Al-Qaeda. So sometime in 2002, 2003, uh, CIA becomes aware of a guy called Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. Now, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti means the father of Ahmed from Kuwait. It's not a very precise clue because there are lots of Kuwaitis, millions, and many of them have kids called, called Ahmed. But it was the beginning of finding the courier. In 2004, somebody else in al-Qaeda was arrested in Iraq. He was sent to a CIA secret prison, and he was also coercively interrogated, not waterboarded. He said, somewhere in his interrogation, it's not clear before he was coercively interrogated or, or, or afterwards, that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti was one of bin Laden's couriers. In 2007, a foreign intelligence service, probably almost certainly the Pakistanis, told the United States that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti's real name was Ibrahim Saeed and, uh, and was in fact a Pakistani because this guy, even though he's called al Kuwaiti, he had grown up in Kuwait, but he was actually a Pakistani. Um, so by 2007, there is, a, there is a real name for this guy. There's a sense that he's an important player in Al Qaeda. There's a sense that he's a courier, but he is not seen as the courier. Um, but the one thing at CIA, which is interesting, is no one's seen this guy for a long time the one that they're detaining. In 2010, National Security Agency, which is basically the eavesdropping agency of the United States government, intercepts a phone call from Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti to somebody in the Gulf, and the content of the phone call is something along the lines that it becomes clear that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti is still in al-Qaeda, uh, which was still a question at the CIA. At that point, um, and this, and this call is traced to Peshawar, Pakistan, in Western Pakistan. Well, now, this is a huge city in Western Pakistan with several million people. Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, the courier, is living in Abtabad, Pakistan, which is two and a half hours' drive from Peshawar. Pakistan, by the way, is a country of 180 million people, twice the size of California. So finding people, and particularly somebody called Ibrahim, Ibrahim Saeed, which is a relatively common name, is, is not easy. At a certain point, CIA puts officers and, or agents on the ground in Peshawar, Pakistan, and follows this guy back to Abdabad, Pakistan. Um, and they were very, you know, what's interesting, he's living in a house which seems to be designed to prevent surveillance from almost any direction. The house doesn't have internet service and it doesn't have phone service. 
and it seems a bit bigger than the other houses in the area. And suddenly, this is of considerable interest to Leon Panetta, the director of the CIA. And he goes to President Obama and, and other people in the White House, a very small group of people, probably at, at this point, six people in the White House know what is going on. And Panetta says, we have found this compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, and some of my people believe that bin Laden is living there. And there isn't sort of high fives or anything like that in the, in the White House, in the Oval Office, because just a few months before, the most promising lead uh, on the number two in Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawari, had ended up with seven CIA officers and, and, and contractors being killed in eastern Afghanistan. A Jordanian had come forward saying that he could lead uh, the CIA to uh, the number two in Al-Qaeda. He, in fact, was he, in fact, he was a triple agent. He'd been recruited by Al-Qaeda. He had not been recruited by the CIA. And when uh, he came for his first meeting with his CIA handlers in eastern Afghanistan, he blew himself up, killing seven American, seven CIA uh, employees and contractors. So, and that was in December 30th, 2009. So the context of going back to the Oval Office and saying, hey, we've got another great lead on bin Laden, no one got too excited. Uh, people said, that's interesting. Liam Panetta uh, was very frustrated that they could never get a picture of bin Laden. They obviously sent satellites over. Bin Laden had, was being very careful. He was basically spending most of his time on the second or third floor of this building. When he would go out for a very occasional walk, he did so under a tarpaulin, which basically prevented any kind of satellite picture being taken of him. At one point, Liam Panetta said to um, his team, let's get the uh, geo national geospatial image imagery folks involved because if we can't get a picture of bin Laden directly, certainly he has a shadow, we can measure his shadow. We know he's six foot four. And so uh, they come back and they say, well, we've got the answer, sir. Um, this is somebody between the height of five foot three and six foot eight. Um, <laughs> so that didn't pan out. And then they also uh, went, Panetta was getting very frustrated. As, as, as you know, may know, he's a, very, he's a wonderful guy who's uh, very warm, and, but he's also quite a tough boss. And uh, his chief of staff, Jeremy Bash, went to the bin Laden team and said, you know, the boss is getting very frustrated and he wants to be convinced by you that you are doing everything you can to get inside this compound, to get a picture, to get some intelligence more than just this circumstantial case. And uh, Jeremy Bash t said to the bin Laden team, come up with 25 ideas. You can, some of them can be a little crazy about you know, how to get a picture or get inside or get better information. And so the team came back with 38 ideas. One, and a couple of them were clearly absurd, but I'll, give you, I'll tell you what they were. One was to throw a stink bomb into the compound and get people out that way. Another one was to broadcast uh, what purported to be the voice of Allah uh, commanding uh, the uh, inhabitants of the compound to leave. Of course, these were not serious, but Panetta was convinced that his team were coming up with creative ideas. And one of the ideas which was creative, if ethically quite dubious, was the idea of mounting a fake vaccination program in Abtabad in order to get DNA from the people inside the Abtabad compound. So they hired, they basically got a Pakistani doctor by the name of Afridi to mount a fake vaccination program in Abtabad. They were never able to get access to the bin Laden kids uh, on the compound and match their DNA to existing DNA that the US government has of uh, bin Laden relatives. But clearly there was an effort to really think creatively about how to get better intelligence. But the better intelligence never came. It was always a circumstantial case. There was clearly a third family, in addition to the two bodyguards and their family living on this compound. They were behaving suspiciously. The two bodyguards were lying about what they were doing to their neighbors, to their family, to their family members. They were saying they were living in another city. To the neighbors, they gave some cover story that they were in the transportation business. Clearly, somebody in this compound was being hidden. The question is, who was it? And uh, the people who were following bin Laden for years were convinced it was bin Laden. But other people inside the CIA were not at all convinced that this was bin Laden. And in fact, they had been very badly burnt by the weapons of the mass destruction fiasco in Iraq, a, a circumstantial case that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which turned out to be wrong. And one of the, uh, I think, most telling anecdotes in the book, at a certain point, President Obama turns to Michael Morell, who's the deputy director of the CIA, and says, why are some analysts saying there's a 40% chance that bin Laden's in the compound? Why are you saying there's a 60% chance? And why are other people saying there's a 90% chance that bin Laden is, is in this compound? 
And Michael Morrell says, this is really a generational thing. People who are following bin Laden all their lives, you know, they are convinced this is bin Laden. People like myself, who basically lived through the weapons of mass destruction fiasco in Iraq, you know, are very leery of a circumstantial case. And we are, you know, we're much more skeptical. And, it, and then he says, Mr. President, in terms of the data available, the circumstantial case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction is, was gr is greater than the circumstantial case that bin Laden is living in this compound. And if I was president, that would certainly give me a lot of pause. Uh, the idea that this was a less good case circumstantially than, than the Iraq having weapons of mass destruction. Which brings us to President Obama as a decision maker. So presidents, you know, we, we elect presidents to make difficult decisions, often with imperfect information. And intelligence itself is not necessarily information. Intelligence is kind of an assessment uh, with, which may or may not be right. By January, the president is, is tiring of, by January, people that I talk to familiar with his thinking say that the president basically had, had grown tired of the question of could we make the intelligence picture better. The only way to make the intelligence picture better was to take much, much more risks on the ground and basically you know, become more visible in the surveillance and essentially spook the target potentially. And so in January, he said, we need a plan. You know, we got to stop, we need to, you know, the intelligence isn't getting any better, but we need a plan of action. And so the plan of action, the first call uh, was made to Admiral McRaven, the head of Spe Joint Special Operations Command, basically come to Washington and we, we, we need to tell you something. And he goes to the CIA and there's a discussion about this interesting compound that bin Laden may be living in. Um, and soon there are National Security Council meetings uh, about what to do. And basically there are four or five ideas about what to do. The first idea is a B-2 B bombing raid on the compound. This is fairly quickly dismissed when, it sh when people point out that it would require 32 500 pound bombs to destroy this compound, which is about an acre large. Uh, now, and General James Cartwright, who is uh, President Obama's number two military advisor said, this would be like having a small earthquake going off in a fairly large Pakistani city. And it came freighted with a lot of other problems. Not only would you have civilian casualties um, and you know, be bombing a pretty large city of a supposed ally, but secondly, um, you know, there would be no proof that bin Laden was dead or alive. You would know, there would be no way to prove it to yourself. There would be no intelligence collection at the site. Um, so the B-2 bombing raid was dismissed relatively rapidly. Also dismissed relatively rapidly was some kind of joint operation with the Pakistanis. Relations with the Pakistanis have been getting worse and worse. An American CIA contractor had just killed two Pakistanis uh, in January. As the decision was being made, he was being held in, in a Pakistani jail. There were concerns. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the pa U.S.-Pakistan relationship was, was or very bad, and there were concerns that if we told the Pakistanis about this operation, the information would leak. So that was dismissed relatively quickly, too. So the, really, the, real, the, real, is, the real issues became, um, essentially a drone strike using an experimental bomb which had never been used in combat before. Um, no one would tell me directly what the bomb was, but I, by, by talking to enough people, I realized this bomb was tiny. Uh, probably a, basically a 12 pound bomb. The, the, small, the, the smallest bomb the United States Air Force drops is 500 pounds. This is a tiny bomb um, and it had never been used in combat. Admiral Mike Mullen, uh, President Obama's principal military advisor, was very opposed to this idea. He was, we, he said, we've, he told me, we've over-relied on technology too many times. This was an untried weapon. Um, and the drone strike idea came freighted with some of the same problems about the B-2. One of which was, could you really prove it was bin Laden if he was killed in a drone strike? Uh, could you pick up intelligence at the bin Laden house? No, if it was a drone strike. Drone strikes also, people survive drone strikes. Uh, or it could miss. Um, and although it would be a pretty stealthy thing to do that maybe you could deny it even happened, there were, there were problems with a drone strike. The other option, of course, was a U.S. Navy SEAL raid. And the other option was sort of, let's just sort of wait and see and see if we can gather more intelligence. And of course, in human, li in human nature, there's a natural tendency to kind of put off decisions. And, but there were also some problems about waiting, because the longer you waited, the more people knew what, the more people you know, somebody said, uh, Tom Donnellan, the National Security Advisor to President Obama said, you know, the way you keep a secret in Washington is you don't tell anyone. Um, and, uh, but of course, more and more people know some part of this story. Um, and there was concerns that this would leak. And so the final National Security Council meeting is on 
uh, April 28th, Thursday, April 28th, and basically President Obama goes around the table and asks people for the, he doesn't, it's not a vote, but he asks them, tell me what you think. Sec uh, Robert Gates, who had served every president since Richard Nixon, in fact started working in the White House when President Obama was 13, uh, said I'm against the, um, the idea of doing a, uh, boots on the ground. Robert Gates had been the executive assistant to um, Stansfield Turner, the director of the CIA, the night that Operation Eagle Claw, sometimes known as Desert One, basically the fiasco in Iran where the American hostages were not rescued and instead uh, uh, several American soldiers were killed and the whole operation, the whole rescue operation basically was a kind of catastrophic failure. And that of course contributed to Jimmy Carter being a one-term president the failure of that operation. So Secretary, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, every meeting would mention the Iranian fiasco. And he was also concerned about completely blowing apart what remained of the US-Pakistan relationship. He was concerned about supplying our troops in Afghanistan if that happened. Um, so, uh, and Vice President Joe Biden said, I'm against this. He was concerned about perhaps an attack on the US Embassy if things went wrong, as it happened in, in, in Islamabad, as it happened in 1979. Um, and it shared some of the same concerns uh, that, that Secretary Gates did. And, and also, you know, but, you know what, if hap what happens if bin Laden isn't there? This was still, to many people in the room, this was not a proven case. Uh, President Obama's second uh, most senior military advisor, James Cartwright, uh, was advocating the drone strike. So that was one set of advice. On the other side of the advice was Liam Panetta, the, secretary of the, the CIA director, Panetta basically said, look, what if a group of ordinary Americans were in this room and knew what we knew now? What would they say? And you know, he said, they would say, do this. The risks are merited. Hillary Clinton gave a long and loyally presentation. No one knew where she was going. She, where, she said, here are the pros, here are the cons. And at the end of it, she said, I'm in favor of the raid. She was, of course, senator from New York. This was something that was meant, you know, a very visceral thing for her. Uh, and uh, she said to me, look, you know, President Obama is not persuaded by an emotional performance. I mean, he wants to hear a, a case, and that's why I gave this long case. Admiral Mike Mullen said, do the raid. He had gone to the rehearsals, the last rehearsals of the SEAL raid took place in Nevada, uh, and he uh, had spent a lot of time with the U.S. Navy SEALs, had spent a lot of time with McRaven, had total faith in their capabilities. And he, he said, let's do this. That's interesting, by the way, because usually, Secretary Robert Gates and uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, would be on the same side of every issue. Here they are on different sides. So at 7 p.m. this meeting ends and President Obama goes back to his residence and 13 hours later he comes out and says, it's a go. Um, I don't think that's necessarily an easy choice to make. Um, he was getting conflicting advice um, and it's easy in a sort of post facto to sort of say, well, it turned out well, so therefore it was an easy decision. Uh, if it had gone differently, uh, you know, President Obama, you know, I think it would have been something that would be very hard to recover from. We know that it turned out well, uh, but there were still problems. Uh, you know, one of the Black Hawks went down, um, and uh, you know, if if two Black Hawks had gone down, probably the operation would not have would not have succeeded at all. Um, Admiral Mike Mullen said something very interesting to me, which I think goes to the question of President Obama's decision making, which is it was President Obama who insisted that there be more backup uh, for the operation. Um, Admiral Mike Mullen, of course, served both George W. Bush and President Obama as a sort of non-political person. Uh, but when Admiral McRaven conceived of the operation, he thought that part of the idea behind the operation was not to anger the Pakistanis unnecessarily. And in one of the final National Security Council meetings, President Obama said, you know, that is not our first priority. Our first priority is getting our guys out. Which brings me to, I just want to briefly talk about the evolution of U.S. Special Forces and Admiral McRaven himself, because I think he's a very interesting character in all this. Admiral McRaven basically set up the Special Operations curric Curriculum at the Naval Postgraduate School, worked for President George W. Bush doing counterterrorism after 9-11. And he wrote a book called Special Ops, which was very useful for my thinking about him, because what he did in this book was he examined eight successful special operations, seven from World War II, and one was the raid on Antibi. The raid, and I'll describe two of them, because they're very relevant to what happened in Abtabad. In one operation, the um, anti-fascist partisans 
basically kidnap Mussolini uh, in, in, in 1941, and the Nazis decided to rescue Mussolini. The way, and Mussolini was being held in a hotel in the mountains. The Nazis sent in uh, sort of experimental gliders that had not been used before, uh, uh, and they landed near the hotel. Not a shot was fired, and Mussolini was rescued by the Nazis. The raid on Entebbe was, of course, when the Israelis uh, were taken hostage by Palestinian terrorists in Entebbe in Uganda in the early 70s. The guy who, mounted the, who ran the, uh, the rescue operation was Jonathan Netanyahu, Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu's oldest brother, uh, a very interesting officer who read Machiavelli to relax. And he, he, um, he can see, no one thought that somebody would fly from Israel to Uganda, seven hour flight, and would rescue these hostages. And uh, the way that Netanyahu organized the operation was he dressed all his men as Uganda, in Ugandan military uniforms. When they landed at Entebbe Airport to rescue the hostages, they were driving exactly the same kind of Mercedes that a Ugandan general would be driving. They drove towards the, 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 the part of the airport where the hostages were being held, and they rescued the hostages in three minutes. And so, and the way that McRaven wrote the book is that he went to the sites of these operations. He interviewed all the people involved that were still alive. And he derived certain principles from this. Uh, so some of them are obvious. Surprise. You know, Bin Laden did not expect that a group of Navy SEALs would drop in to a city in the middle of Pakistan and cap try and capture or kill him. Nor did the Pakistan, and of course, the stealth helicopters, they'd never been used in this kind of combat before. Repetition was another very big kind of... Uh, takeaway that McRaven took from these, looking at these cases. The SEALs on this mission repeatedly rehearsed the mission. There was no, when they went in, they, they knew, everybody knew exactly what was gonna happen. Uh, a sense of purpose, you know, everybody on that mission really wanted to get Bin Laden. Um, so McRaven sort of distilled these, 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 these lessons and he applied them. One of the lessons he also said, that the operation has to be over in 30 minutes. If it's usually these, these really successful operations, 30 minutes or less. Now, of course, the helicopter went down. The mission, instead of to lasting 30 minutes as planned, lasted about 43 minutes, by which time, of course, the Pakistanis are scrambling their F-16 jets. Hard to find an American stealth helicopter in the middle of the night in Pakistan for the Pakistanis. Uh, but, you know, there was clearly a response was, was being planned uh, by the Pakistanis. But... Um, so I think President Obama did not have to worry about the military component of the raid, even though something did go wrong, because US Special Forces are, are so skilled at this point. Um, you know, it was a difficult decision because of what Pakistani's reaction might be, what happens if bin Laden isn't there, what happens if there's a firefight with the Pakistanis, what happens if you have large numbers of civilian casualties. Um, and the, the White House planned for every eventuality. By the way, they including bin Laden being captured. There was a plan, if bin Laden was captured, there was a plan to take him to Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. There were FBI and CIA uh, interrogators standing by, Arab linguists. Of course, that was unnecessary. And bin Laden didn't die in a heroic shootout in the mountains of Afghanistan. He died surrounded by his three wives and a dozen kids in a suburban compound in Pakistan. And I think that anti-heroic ending um, is indicative of where bin Laden was and where al-Qaeda was. There was no spectacular martyrdom. Um, he didn't fight back. He had an opportunity to surrender. The, the helicopter crash happened 15 minutes before he died. So certainly if the helicopter crashes in your house, uh, you, know, you know that something's up. And um, <laughs> he, uh, he didn't fight back. He had two guns in his room, which he didn't reach for. Um, so, you know, I think the likelihood that he would have come out and conspicuously, conspicuously surrendered was very low because he repeatedly said he's willing to die. Why didn't he fight back? Um, I think, you know, bear in mind this is the middle of the night. There's no moon at all. There's no electricity in the neighborhood because the somebody had thoughtfully turned the electricity off. Um, and it's a confusing situation. And, and bin Laden may have been paralyzed. He had no plan B. There was no escape plan. Um, he may have been concerned about having a firefight in the enclosed spaces of his house that would have killed his wives and kids. Uh, the bottom line is, is, of course, we can't check with him now, but he did not fight back. It was not a heroic ending. And one of the really striking things to me is that 
the protests that greeted bin Laden's death in the, around the Muslim world, inclu including in countries like Pakistan, which is probably the most anti-American country in the world right now, the protests were absolutely minuscule. No one cared. So does that mean that getting bin Laden was not worth it? Uh, I think the short answer, of course, of course it was worth it. Even though bin Laden himself had become irrelevant over time, in my view, uh, uh, as a matter of justice for the victims of 9-11 and for their families, uh, as a matter of uh, restoring American honor, uh, it was the right thing to do. So I'll take questions. So we have set up a microphone in the center aisle, and if you have questions, I'd ask you to please queue up at the microphone uh, so that everyone can hear and uh, we can understand the questions. So please. Was it, was it determined in advance that uh, if they got bin Laden and killed him that they would bury him at sea? Yeah, it was. I mean, they, the reason they buried him at sea, uh, I think, is pretty obvious because, you know, they didn't want to create um, sort of a shrine to bin Laden if he was buried somewhere. You know, when often, after Hitler was killed in um, 1945, the Soviets kept his remains and, um, until the 70s, but they, it was a state secret about where these remains were, and eventually they disposed of them because they had concerns about some sort of shrine to Hitler. So at the White House, there was a concern about a shrine to bin Laden. But there was also the understanding that in Muslim um, culture, you have to bury the, the dead within 24 hours. So the reason this was done quite quickly was he was buried you know, with Muslim rites within the first 24 hours. And uh, they had done this once before with a member of Al Qaeda um, in Somalia, where they'd buried him at sea. Um, so they'd, they'd had, they, they, they did call Saudi Arabia, where bin Laden, of course, originally came from, and they talked to the Saudi government and they said, do you want bin Laden back? And the Saudi government said, not really. Uh, and so they said, <laughs> and they said, this is our plan. They said, this sounds like a good idea. Uh, and he was buried on May 2nd at 11 a.m. in the Indian Ocean. Can you explain a little bit more about the thinking at Tora Bora and as to why we didn't reinforce uh, the troops there? What, uh, given that how close that was to 9-11 itself and the, and the feelings across the country. What, what led to the uh, failure to uh, go full force at him? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I, I, it's hard to recall now with more than 4,000 American soldiers killed in Iraq and 2,500 American soldiers and, and counting killed in Afghanistan that the Pentagon was very casualty averse in the pre-9-11 era. The last war that the Pentagon had been involved in was Kosovo in 1999, which was a zero casualty war. And there was, it was partly also kind of a result of Black Hawk Down and the 18 American servicemen killed in Mogadishu. There was a sense that the American public wouldn't tolerate casualties, which of course is not true at all. And then the American public, and the US Special Forces were dying to get into the fight at Tora Bora, but they were really kind of kept back uh, except a very small group of them. And um, I communicated with General Tommy Franks, who of course was our commander in Afghanistan at the time, and I had an email exchange with him, and I'll tell you what his reasonings were, which is they were very concerned about not repeating what they saw as the mistakes of the Soviet, having a large footprint in Afghanistan. Uh, he also said that the intelligence that bin Laden was at Tora Bora was not clear. I think we now know that that is not true. Uh, he also said that there were concerns about how long it would take people to get there um, and the, you know, that it would take a while. I've talked to people, well-informed people, about how quickly the 82nd Airborne could have got there, for instance, and they say it would have taken less than a week. There were 1,200 Marines in Kandahar at the time. There were around 2,000 uh, soldiers from the 10th Mountain Division in Uzbekistan. I mean, there were American soldiers in theater. They were just not, they were not used. And I think part of it also to, in that, part of it also was using a very small number of US Special Forces with CIA officers on the ground. 
had overthrown the Taliban in three weeks, and it was one of the great victories of unconventional warfare. And there was a feeling, hey, this worked so well, let's not change this. And while it worked very well about overthrowing the Taliban, it did not work well to surround Al Qaeda at the Battle of Tora Bora. You know, I don't want to pretend that if several hundred rangers had gone into Tora Bora, that Bin Laden necessarily still he still might have escaped. Bear in mind, Tora Bora, the mountains go to 14,000 feet. It's the middle of December, it's snowing, it's a very difficult environment. Um, but the fact is it was not attempted. It, it just wasn't even tried, which is very surprising. But I, I think, I hope that I've tried to explain the rationale. Could you comment on the uh, Pakistani physician? Was he a scapegoat for the Pakistanis? Meaning? How about the drive at the CIA or? Sorry? The, the Pakistani physician that helped with the, uh, the vaccine program. Yeah. Did the Pakistanis help? Or, I mean, have they been a hindrance? Or did they, did they know bin Laden was living in Abtabad? Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to prove negatives, but I don't think there's any evidence the Pakistanis knew that bin Laden was living in Abtabad. And the reason I can, I kind of thought that that was the case early on, because go back to the way they treated us in 1997. They were very... This is not a group of people that wants to tell other people what, where bin Laden is if they don't have a need to know. Al Qaeda had tried to kill President Musharraf uh, twice, the president of Pakistan, in 2003, so there was no love lost between the Pakistani government and Al Qaeda. And now we've recovered thousands of documents from the compound in Abtabad, and there's, we, I think our relations with the Pakistanis are pretty bad right now. If there was a smoking gun linking the Pakistani government to bin Laden being in Abtabad, I think we'd know about it. And uh, so far, there isn't. So I don't see, you know, the, one of the things I found out in reporting the book is that there were adults living on the compound who didn't know bin Laden was living there. So one of the bodyguard's wives was instructed by her husband, there is a stranger living here that you cannot talk about to me or to anybody else. And, uh, you know, she only found out it was bin Laden after, the, you know, after he was killed. So. They were taking no chances. There was no reason to tell people in the Pakistani government that he was living there. Um, if, uh, <clears throat> if the U.S. government didn't enter into a firefight and it didn't appear that he was armed at the time that he was taken and there was provisions for interrogation in Afghanistan, why do you think that uh, he ended up not being captured and was killed instead? I think the answer to that, uh, and you can also see this in No Easy Day, um, the book by Marco and the U.S. Navy SEAL who was in the compound, is bin Laden would have had to conspicuously surrender, which is come, come out, hands up, you know. He, he, he would have had to do what he didn't do. Um, and I, I don't think this, by the way, is peculiar to this operation. I mean, standard rules of engagement for the U.S. military is somebody conspicuously surrenders. It's a war crime to kill him. But bin Laden, as I said, he had 15 minutes to, to respond. Um, he must have known that this was not a usual event, that this was people, it, there was a firefight, not only a helicopter crash. Clearly, this was the Americans coming. Um, and he didn't, he didn't conspicuously surrender. That said, you know, a visit from the US Navy SEALs is not a visit from the Red Cross. Um, and um, <laughs> they, killed, they killed every adult male on the compound, they also killed an adult female who's clearly a non-combatant, and they wounded another adult female who's clearly a non-combatant. And it's interesting, when I'm in Europe, places like Germany, where there's, this is almost like the first question people ask, is like, wasn't this a sort of a war crime? Um, and you know, I, what I say to that is, you know, the, the 3,000 people in the World Trade Center weren't, you know, their rights weren't really respected by bin Laden. And I don't, that's, um, you know, I'm, the fact is, is that uh, I think that law was adhered to since we're here, at, uh, you know, to celebrate a, a great legal mind. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there was certainly a plan to deal with a captured bin Laden. There was a plan to deal with a captured bin Laden who was wounded, a captured bin Laden who was being uncooperative. Uh, they planned for every contingency. On that point of the law, uh, No Easy Day and the subsequent 60 Minutes program that we're, uh, the author talked about that, he, he more or less implied that this is kind of what we do every day. Yeah. And that these guys are out doing these missions on a very consistent basis. So, you know, the legal framework for Obama is one thing, but 
as a consistent issue within the room full of attorneys. Well, how about the, the, the continued legal framework for uh, a more programmatic effort as, the, as it's been played out? Meaning, what is the legal framework for these operations? Yes. Well, the legal Maybe not so much that, but, the, but maybe you can comment on the volume of them. Well, the volume is, you know, is that's one of the reasons that President Obama didn't, the, the thing he worried about the least was the execution of the actual operation, because the same night that there was this operation in Pakistan, there were a dozen operations of very similar nature in Afghanistan, some of which might have been, from a military point of view, more tricky. Uh, so, you know, you're having a dozen operations of, of these operations every night in Afghanistan, and you know this this joint special operations command which was really developed in iraq under general sandy mccrystal you know they are incredibly skilled at what they do um, the larger legal framework under which this all falls is the author authorization for the use of military force aumf which was only one american congressman voted against uh, immediately after 9 11. i think it's a very interesting question when combat troops leave afghanistan there would be a pretty good argument to say does this authorization for, US, for the use of military force, is it really necessary or, or even really uh, proper, proper? Because at that point, um, you know, the authorization for use of military force was against al-Qaeda and its allies. Um, but it's been expanded to, a, you know, we, we're now fighting a covert war in, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about President Obama as a commander in chief because I think it's relevant to his decision here. This is one of the most aggressive presidents in the modern era, and, and if you think about it, we've fought in various forms wars in about six Muslim countries uh, since President Obama has been commander in chief. Iraq, which was winding down, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Um, and most of that is under the rubric of the authorization for the use of military force. Now, the congressmen and congresswomen who voted for this immediately after 9-11, I don't think we're thinking this is gonna go on for a decade or a decade or more. Um, and so I think there will be a, a movement, certainly by liberals, to try and kind of maybe reduce the scope of the authorization of the use of military force uh, as combat troops come out of Afghanistan. One final point here. In, in, in my book, I went back and I read President Obama's uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in Oslo. You may recall he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize almost immediately. Now, there are not many people who go to Oslo to accept the Nobel Peace Prize to use it as an opportunity to describe their philosophy of war, which is what he did. And basically, here's what he said. He said, much as I admire Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi non-aggression would not have stopped the Nazis, and negotiation with Al-Qaeda is unlikely to produce results. And you know, this is, I think, the, the kind of person he is. He's the first major American political figure for a long time who is not burdened by what he did or did not do in Vietnam. You know, Senator John McCain, Senator John Kerry, their whole political careers have in a sense been about what they, would, what they did or did not do in, in Vietnam. Um, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, what, the fact that they didn't serve in Vietnam has been part of their political story. Obama's simply too young. He's not burdened by this Vietnam syndrome, which particularly afflicted the Democratic Party. So he's been very comfortable with the use of American hard power which I think has been surprising to many people who voted for him, thinking he was some kind of pacifist. How do you see the death of uh, Osama bin Laden in terms of the long-term mission of Al-Qaeda? Will it have a negative effect, or will they continue to uh, do what they're doing? Yeah, you know, I believe in a kind of old-fashioned view of history, which is certain men make a difference. And you know, it's very hard to explain why the French went to Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon. It's impossible to understand the Holocaust without Hitler. Now, bin Laden is not as a world-changing figure as either Napoleon or Hitler, but he certainly changed our lives in many ways. And bin Laden founded Al Qaeda in 1988. It was his idea. Our attacking us on 9/11 was bin Laden's strategic conception, and I want to talk about that briefly because it. What was, why, did, why were we attacked on 9-11? You know, bin Laden had a theory of the case, which was he wanted to get us out of the Middle East by attacking us. He thought we'd get out. He thought we were a paper tiger. When we interviewed him in, in 1997, he said, essentially, America is as weak as the former Soviet Union. Look at your pullout from Vietnam. Look at your pullout out of Beirut after the Marine barracks attack. Look at your pullout from, Be from Mogadishu after the Black Hawk Down incident. Well, you know, it was a very naive view of the United States. I mean, we're not gonna pull out of the Middle East because we're attacked in Washington or New York. 
And if you recall, immediately after 9-11, there was a lot of discussion. This was like Pearl Harbor, but it, and it was a surprise attack. But it was really like Pearl Harbor in the following sense. Pearl Harbor led in inevitably to the collapse of in Imperial Japan. It was a tactical victory that led to a strategic defeat. Al-Qaeda scored a tactical victory on 9-11, but it's led to their strategic defeat. They didn't get what they wanted. The United States is not out of the Middle East. We're more engaged in the Middle East than we've ever been in our history. We have giant bases in Qatar and Bahrain and Kuwait. We're in Afghanistan. We were in Iraq. Um, Al-Qaeda, which means the base in Arabic, lost the best base they ever had in Afghanistan. You know, it was a complete strategic failure. Um, so in that way, 9-11 was Al-Qaeda's Pearl Harbor. Uh, Mr. Bergen, uh, when, when you were in New York, did, did you ever meet with or talk to a, an author named, uh, I think his name is Gerald Posner? Uh, you know, I know, who, who, I know, uh, I know his work. He wrote some stuff about the emergence of Al-Qaeda in New York in the early 90s. Yeah, I, I don't, I have not met him directly. I know who you're referring to, sir. Sir, following your uh, interview with Bin Laden in 1997, what were your feelings uh, after 9-11, uh, after all the American casualties, uh, knowing that Bin Laden was the orchestrator? Well, I mean, you know, I, you know, my, you know, I was, I've, I had a kind of interest, I mean, I, I almost felt guilty. I mean, even though it's obviously nothing to do with my, my you know, I. I I had written, I'd written a four-page letter to a friend of mine at the New York Times called John Burns, who was at the time their sort of chief foreign correspondent. I wrote the letter on August 18th, 2001, um, and I basically said, you know, in a four-page letter, here is why I think there is going to be an attack, a very large-scale attack from al-Qaeda. I didn't say it was going to be in the United States. I wasn't sure where it was going to be, but anybody who was paying any attention to this knew that something big was happening. There was just so many... And obviously, I didn't have any access to what the U.S. government, its own assessments. The CIA was repeatedly warning in the summer of 2001 about a potential attack. Um, the problem really wasn't an intelligence failure. I think it was more of a policy failure. It was policymakers did not believe al Qaeda was a threat. If you think about the George W. Bush administration when they came into office, it was their concerns were Russia, China, and anti-ballistic missile defense. This has got nothing to do with al Qaeda. They they had sort of missed the Al-Qaeda story. They'd been out of office for a long time. So my reaction, you know, it was, you know, it was like, a, I mean, it was, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, it was, it was that, unfortunately, this guy who I'd met in 97, who I'd been writing about, I completed a book about him 10 days before 9-11. Unfortunately, he'd made good on his threats. Um, it was a very disturbing moment in American history when you go to work in Washington, you see armored personnel carriers on the street at night. Um, so I think my reaction was pretty similar to most people's reaction, which was one of shock and horror. Any more questions? Mr. Bergen, I think you're going to be signing books in, in the lobby uh, for book signing. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you for being here.